Well, I want to welcome you one more time to worship, whether you're here in the room with us or you're watching on video. And you know, we don't believe it's any accident that you're here. We believe God brought you here for a reason, and he has something that he wants to speak into your life, something that he wants you to take away. And so we celebrate that he has you here on purpose, and we are glad that you are here. Now, we're in the third week of a series called Four, and the heart behind this series is that God says he is for us and not against us. But you know, a lot of times that can be hard to believe. Sometimes we start to question that. And we need to be reminded again and again that we have a God who is for us. And it makes all the difference in the world. But not only that, God is also for our community. Last week, if you were here, that's what we talked about, how God has a heart for the city. God has a heart for the community. But the problem is there are many people in our neighborhoods, many people in our communities who aren't convinced of that. They feel maybe like Christians are against them or God is against them. And so we need to go out as the body of Christ and to Share that good news that we have a God who is for the community. We have a God who is for our neighborhoods. And today, what I want to talk with you about is that God is for our world. Now, the question in this series for us to ask then is, are we for what God is for? You know, God has made it clear what his heart is. Does our heart match God's heart? You know, if you looked and took an inventory of your life, you know, where you spend a majority of your time and your energy and your focus and your finances, I think looking at those things would start to give us a picture of what we're for. You know, the things that we invest most into are the things that we are most for. So again, I ask you the question, are you for what God is for? Now, I think it's easy to look around at our world today and to feel hopeless, to feel frustrated, to feel disappointed, maybe sometimes even to feel disgusted. You know, have you ever had a day when you're watching the news or you're reading the newspaper and you think, you know, today would be a good day for God to just show up and show some people who's boss. Like, there's some people out there that really need to be taught a lesson today. Have you ever felt that way? Or how about a time maybe where something happens, you know, like this horrible school shooting, and you think, you know, maybe God should just take the big extra sketch and just shake it up a little bit, you know, like maybe just start over. It can just be so disheartening to see what goes on in our world. We're surrounded by so much darkness and so much evil. And just like we talked about last week when it comes to our community, it can be awfully easy for us to feel negative and critical and judgmental. But the problem is when we have those sorts of emotions, when we look out at the world, it really colors our relationships and the way we look at others and the way that we maybe interact with others. And so what I want you to understand today is that even though there is a lot of darkness And even though there is a lot of evil and a lot of disappointment and a lot of hopelessness all throughout the world, the world is not going to hell in a handbasket. There is actually reason to have hope. And there's reason to have confidence. Because when we understand God's heart for the world, and when we remember his promises that he always keeps, we can see then that God is bringing light into the darkness. He's flipping on the lights, even though it often seems like everything is going downhill. And not only that, God is calling you and me to play a key vital role in his mission to bring light into the darkness. We need to remember again and again that God is for our world. Well, tonight I want to focus on one key verse, and it might be the most popular and recognized Bible verse in all of Scripture. 
Maybe you've even seen it sometimes in the end zone of a football game. Of course, it's the verse John 3.16. And I think in this one verse, it sums up God's heart for our world and God's heart for its people. So I want to invite you to read this with me. And that goes for all of you watching this on video too. You can read this together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There is so much goodness and so much richness in those few words. But I want to break it down with you for just a bit and to look at what it's really saying and communicating into our situation and into our world. So it starts out by saying, God so loved the world. Just appreciate those word choices. You know, it starts with God, the creator of the universe, God who is in charge of all things, who created you and me. He created everything we can see and everything we can't see. He created this entire world. Now, the word world in Greek that John uses in his gospel is the word cosmos. You've maybe heard that used before, but the way John uses it in his gospel He says that the cosmos or the world is all the things that are hostile to God, all of the things that are actively working against God. And with that in mind, then think about what it's saying when it's showing God's heart for the world. God doesn't just love the world the way it was on day one when it was perfect. God doesn't just love the world in some future version when he puts everything back together. No, it's telling us that God loves our present world with all of its flaws and imperfections, with all of its darkness, with all of its problems and struggles. Even with all of the things that are actively fighting against God, all of the things that are in opposition to God, God still has a heart for that world. God still chooses to love that world. Now, you might think it would be natural to say, well, God is disappointed in the world, though, or God's frustrated with the world, or God is sometimes fed up with the world, or God is angry with the world. But no, here it says, God so loved the world his primary emotion towards a world that turns against him is overwhelming love. And that's what motivates his actions. That's the best description of his heart. But the question is, when the world thinks about God, or maybe more importantly, just in our interactions, when the world gets a picture of God through us as his followers— do they conclude God so loves the world? In the way that we treat people, in the way that we go out and interact with people, in the message that we bring as followers of Christ, do people readily see and believe that God so loved the world? Or do they get a different message? And if people are getting a different message, a different picture of God, well, then we have some serious soul searching to do as followers of Jesus. Now, I think an amazing thing about God's love for the world is how he chose to express his love for the world. Because he didn't just choose to say it or to write it, he didn't just do it once and just expect us to figure it out. Instead, God expressed the truest form of love. And I think two core components of that love are that love is persistent and it's personal. Love is persistent and it's personal. God was persistent in showing his love for the world. And he made it personal 
in coming in the form of Jesus. Now, when you're dating someone, you know that you have to be persistent, right? You want to show and express your love again and again. You want to be thoughtful. You want to be creative. You want to go out on great dates. You want that person to feel special and loved again and again. But I think the problem in many marriages today is that persistence kind of fades away. You know, oftentimes couples stop pursuing each other after the wedding day. You know, you put in a ton of effort, a ton of creativity when you're dating, but then suddenly all the busyness comes and that persistence, that pursuit goes away. I remember my grandpa always telling a story, he was a pastor, and he said, there was a woman who came and talked to her husband and said, you know, why don't you ever tell me that you love me? And he thought for a bit and he said, well, honey, I told you I loved you on the day we were married and I'll let you know if anything changes. (laughs) Not good advice, right? True love requires persistence and it requires pursuit. It continually expresses itself to the other person. But also, love has to be personal. It has to be present. You can't send an assistant. You can't send a representative to express love to someone else. You know, if I designated one of my friends to bring flowers to my wife on our anniversary, it's not going to go well, right? Love needs to be personal, and it needs to be persistent, So God had this long history of pursuing his people, starting all the way back in the Garden of Eden when everything went haywire and Adam and Eve chose to disobey him and it introduced sin into the equation and our world was broken and full of sin. God didn't give up. He continued to love people and to love the world. And so he sent leaders. He sent Moses and Aaron and Joshua and others And they were able to redirect the people into a relationship with God for a little bit, and then they would stray away. So eventually, God sent kings like all the other nations had, and the people wanted. Well, the kings themselves had a problem staying faithful to God. And so next, God chose to bring judges to his people, and the judges would also kind of get the people back into line, and then they would stray away. So then over the course of hundreds of years, God sent prophets Prophets to come and bring a message of judgment and a a message of warning and also a message of promise. You see, again and again, God was pursuing his people. He didn't give up. He was persistent. And why? Well, because God so loved the world. When one solution didn't work, he tried something else. And then something else. He tried again and again and again to get through to the people that he loved. And so finally, his ultimate solution was to make it personal in the form of his son, Jesus. He showed up in our world. He moved into the neighborhood. He was both persistent and he was personal. But then there's another word choice in John 3.16. It's such a powerful word. It says he gave Jesus to us. He gave Jesus to us. Now, this doesn't mean that he gave us like a cute little Christmas present with the baby Jesus in it. Now, when he uses the word gave, he's talking about giving Jesus up to his death. He gave Jesus' his life for you and for me, so that we could have forgiveness and so that we could have new life. Jesus isn't just any gift. He's the ultimate sacrifice so that we could have freedom and we could be healed. You know, sometimes when we give a gift to someone, it really expresses how much we value them. And so think for a moment what it tells us that, Jesus, that God would give Jesus to us as a gift. God so loved the world. God so loved each one of us that he was even willing to sacrifice his only son. 
Now, some important context about this comes in the two verses before John 3.16. I mean, whoever quotes John 3.14 or 3.15, right? But let's look at it for a moment. It says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus is telling a story from the Old Testament, from the book of Numbers, chapter 21. God's people, like they often did, were straying away. They were doing evil things. They were engaged in destructive behavior. And so God needed to come and discipline them and punish them and get them back on track. So what he did in this situation is he sent poisonous snakes into their camp. And if they were bit by a snake, they were doomed to die except there was one thing they could do. There was a bronze snake that was put up on a pole. And they were told if they would look up at that snake and if they would believe that God could and would heal them, they would be healed. So now Jesus is saying, just as that happened to the Israelites, that he is about to be lifted up. Again, a powerful word choice because think of how Jesus was lifted up. He was lifted up on a cross. He was lifted up when he was raised from the dead. He was lifted up when he ascended to be with God in heaven. And just like the Israelites, we all engage in destructive behaviors. We are all separated from God by sin. And so as Jesus is lifted up on the cross, we're invited to look to him for our salvation, to look to him with our trust so that we can be forgiven. As he puts it at the end of John 3.16, he says, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. What an amazing gift. There's a story I heard about a college class. They were coming to the end of the semester, so they were gonna take a big test and the professor on the last day before the test said, all right, everybody, you can bring one notebook piece of paper with you with any notes you want to take. You can bring that to the test. And so everybody went back to their dorm room, and you can imagine the tiny print they tried to use to fit every single word they could on one notebook piece of paper. Well, finally, it was the day of the test, and everybody came with their sheet of paper except one classmate came with a blank sheet of paper. And he took his page of notebook paper and he put it on the ground, and suddenly another person came through the door. It was a graduate student, and he had the graduate student stand on his piece of paper and give him all the answers. And when all the tests were collected, he was the only student who got an A on the test. Now, every one of us is going to stand before God and face the ultimate test. God's going to ask us a question. Why should I let you enter my heaven? And the thing is, there is no way we can earn it. There's no way we can deserve it. There's no way we can talk ourselves into it. But you know what? There is someone who will stand in for us, and that's Jesus. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Church, God's heart is clear. God so loved the world. God is for the world. You see, that's his purpose. And that's our purpose as a church. When we ask the question, well, why do we do what we do? Why do we come together? Why are we in this place? Our purpose is that God so loved the world. He wants everyone to come back into a relationship. And God's mission is clear. He sent Jesus to seek and save the lost, to put all broken things back together. And so our mission as a church is the same to go and share the good news far and wide so that people can enter into a saving relationship 
with Jesus. So the question is, what are we going to do with that good news? Do we share God's heart for the world? Last week, we shared the figure that there are over 200,000 people within a 10-mile radius of this building who don't have a saving relationship with Jesus. But think on an even bigger scale. There are upwards of 3.5 billion people on earth today who don't have a saving relationship with Jesus. Does that break our heart? Does that make a difference in how we live our life? I mean, are we content to just come here and complain about the volume of the music or the brightness of the lights or the haze or the song choice or the color of the carpet? You know, I think Satan would love nothing, bad, nothing more than for us to get sidetracked by little disagreements, by expressing our opinions. You know, he'll do anything to distract us from God's heart and God's mission to reach all people for Christ. You know, Jesus made or gave us some pretty clear instructions before he ascended into heaven. In Mark 16, 15, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all of creation. Another time, right before he ascended into, the, into heaven, he's talking to his disciples. And he gives them the answer to the question, how is this even going to be possible? I mean, it's such a big job. It's such a big mission. But in Acts 1.8, this is what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Who does he say we're supposed to be? He says, you will be my witnesses. Well, what's a witness? A witness is someone who testifies about something they know to be true. A witness is someone who shares their story. And Jesus says, this means telling people about him. It means telling people what Jesus has done for us, what a difference he's made in our life. But of course, the question then is, well, how are we supposed to do this? It sounds scary. I don't know what to say. And Jesus answers the how question. He says, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit. It means you're not alone. He will come alongside us. He will empower us to be able to do what we need to do. Well, then we would ask, well, where are we supposed to do this? And he answers that too. He says, Jerusalem, which is our local community. Remember, God is for our community. And then he says, Judea which is really our region. You know, maybe it's our state. It's the state of Minnesota. And then he says, Samaria. Now, you might remember that the Samaritans were the sworn enemies of the Israelites. They hated each other. And so Jesus is saying, don't just go to your friends. Go to the people that you most despise. Go to the people you disagree with. You know, go to the people who have a complete different political viewpoint than you do. Go to the people who have nothing in common with you. And then he says, to the ends of the earth, we've got to take this global. It's until every single person has heard the good news. Jesus says, tell people about me. Start in the Twin Cities. Expand out to Minnesota. Minnesota then the entire nation, and then the entire world. Now, these instructions are so expansive and they're so all-encompassing. But you know, he doesn't give us the option to say, well, I'm just gonna keep it to myself or I'm only gonna share it with the people who are close to me. And he doesn't give us the option to just say, well, I only care about my city. I don't care about those other people. 
And he doesn't give us an option to get all nationalistic and say, well, I only care about my country. I mean, they can do what they want to do. And he, of course, gives us no option to only care about the people who look like us or who have the same skin color as us. So finally, why are we supposed to do this? Well, it's because God so loved the world. Now, I think there are so many different ways that we can be a part of God's mission to reach the world with the gospel. Here's a few things that are also listed in your bulletin. First, we can support global ministries and missionaries who are reaching people for Christ. There are so many great organizations, so many great people sharing the gospel far and wide. But when you're looking who to support, I think it's important to ask the question, what are they doing to share the good news of Jesus? You know, there's all kinds of great organizations that do good things for people, but we have the greatest and most important news that's ever been known. What are they doing to share Jesus with other people? One of my favorite organizations is Compassion International. We've sponsored a child, that's his picture up there, his name's Zivi, he lives in Indonesia. We sponsored him for a number of years now, and it's so awesome, we can write letters back and forth. For a little over a dollar a day, you can help feed a child, make sure they get a good education, and they learn about Jesus. And there's other great organizations too, World Vision and a whole list of them. But what are you doing to support ministries and missionaries who are sharing the gospel around the world. Another idea, Feed My Starving Children, another amazing organization. Our mobile pack here at Calvary is coming up January 19th to the 25th. We're gonna try to pack 750,000 meals. And so there are shifts all day, every day, basically. You can come whenever it's convenient for you. Invite your friends, bring your whole workforce with but we're gonna do a, make a huge difference for the kingdom in sharing food, but also sharing the message of Jesus around the world. Another thing, we have an awesome mission opportunity, a mission trip to Bolivia coming up this summer for young adults. So if you fit into that demographic, you're a young adult or you know a young adult, it's gonna be a fabulous opportunity to go and partner with one of the missionaries that Calvary has supported for years. You can go to our website, calvary.org, to get more information about that. Number four, another really important thing as the body of Christ. We need to fight racism and injustice. No matter where it happens, God is for the world, and that means he is for every race, every class, every group of people. There is absolutely no room for racism and prejudice in the kingdom of God. And just a side note, trying to explain it away by trying to resist the politically correct culture today gives you no excuse to tell racist jokes, use racist language, or stereotypes. It is always unacceptable. You know, heaven is gonna be full of every type of person. Revelation 5, 9 puts it very clearly. It says, and they sang a new song, saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and your blood you purchased for God's persons from every tribe and language, and people, and nation. Finally, I want to invite you to take the card out from inside your bulletin. Now, this is a pledge card. It's a sign of commitment to God. You know, we're most likely to follow through on things when we write them down. We hold ourselves accountable. And so one side, you'll find an opportunity to... Think about how God is calling you to invest into this local church, just like God asks us to. You know, God says, bring our first fruits, the first 10% that we earn, because it all belongs to him in the first place, I and mean, we're just temporary caretakers. Now, this is a sign of trust, trusting that God will provide and that he will take care of us. 
It's a sign of trust saying, I believe that God can do more with the 90% that I have than the 100% that I have on my own. Don't just give God your leftovers. Don't just give God a tip. You know, how you use your finances, how you use your time, how you use your energy really gives a picture for what you're for. Are you for what God is for? Are you investing into his kingdom? By giving to this church, you are making a difference around the world. Calvary has a long history of supporting many missionaries all over the world. You can check them out online. But when you invest into this place, it makes a difference in this immediate community, but also to the ends of the earth. If you flip over the pledge card to the side with the logo on it, you see there's also three questions or three spots that you can fill in. One for each week that we've been in in this series. And I want you to think about a commitment that you can make within each area. So first, what is one way that you can commit to remember that God is for you? As we talked about, it's so easy for us to doubt that, to forget that, to question that. So what is something you can do every day to help you remember God is for you? Maybe it's just saying, I'm going to open my Bible every day, at least for a few minutes. Maybe it's regular prayer time. Maybe it's joining a small group. Maybe it's just putting a post-it note on your bathroom mirror. Find one way to commit to remember that God is for you. Then commit to at least one way that you're going to show your community that God is for them. And we've heard great stories this week of people who have been out raking their neighbor's yards or bringing banana bread or inviting people over for dinner. But commit to at least one thing that will show your community that God is for them. And then finally, what is one way that you will show that you are for the world? Maybe it's just saying, I'm going to come to feed my starving children. I'm going to help out. Maybe it's finding a missionary that you're going to support or pray for. Maybe it's sponsoring a child. Are you for what God is for? We're going to invite you to take this card with you this week and to pray about it. Fill it in. Bring it back next week if you would like. You can also submit it online or you can just keep it between you and God. That's fine too. But don't ever forget that God is for you. God is for our community and God is for our world. Don't miss out on this amazing opportunity to invest into what God is for. Because you know what? It will have the greatest return on investment that we can ever imagine. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks that you are a God who is for us. A God who so loved the world that you gave your one and only son. God, help us to never forget that, to never doubt that, to never question that, but instead to just keep it at the forefront of who we are. That you so loved us, that you sent your one and only son, you gave him to us to pay the penalty for our sin. God, let that amazing gift of grace change us in how we interact with every person we meet. And God, day by day, transform our heart to be like your heart. To have a heart for our community, a heart for our neighborhood, and a heart for the entire world. God, help us to partner together to share the good news far and wide like you told us to. And God, I pray that this week that you would help speak to us, that you would help guide us as we consider how we will invest into what you're doing in this church and around the world. God, we're so thankful for all your blessings, for your generosity, for all that you give to us and entrust to us. Help us to trust you, 
to not just live closed-handed, but instead to live life open-handed with all you've given us. God, we thank you for the great privilege that we have to be a part of your family and to be witnesses for you wherever we go. And so, God, we pray these things in the powerful name of your son, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen.